hello everyone. Sound is good. Great. Did everybody get a gift? I brought little gifts from home. So I think uh, Patty didn't get a gift. So please pick something that catches your eye, your fancy. That's a good one. Yeah. So um, I did this because the talk is on uh, Donna Paramita, or the perfection of generosity. Um, my name's Matthew Cruz. I'm a student of uh, Lama Jimpas. Um, I actually started studying Buddhism in the Zen tradition and then um, came over to this tradition, to the Galupka school in uh, Tibetan Buddhism or Vajrayana. And uh, I took refuge with Lama Yesha Jimpa in March of 2019. So to prepare for this talk, I used these references. Um, so you know where this stuff came from. Um, the Six Perfections by Geshe Sonam Rinchen. The Words of My Perfect Teacher by Patrol Rinpoche. Uh, Meditation in Action by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And from the Zen School, Entering the Mind of Buddha by Reb Anderson. Uh, um, reverence to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, I, I bow down and go for refuge to the feet of the excellent Holy Lama Yesha Jimpa, who has great compassion. May the words I speak reflect this compassion, and may my intention to be a source of help and liberation to all sentient beings. So the reason I mentioned that um, I studied Zen prior to coming here, Zen has a very different uh, pedagogy and how uh, we go about the, the process of living a spiritual life. And uh, I found it difficult in the sense that like, I didn't know what was going on. And in this school, uh, there's this thing called the Lam Rim or the, the graduated path, right? So there's actually a path laid out where it's like kind of step by step. If we do these things, it will help us uh, wake up. And I really like that type of methodology and kind of understanding. Um, that's not to say that uh, Zen is wrong or doing it incorrectly or something like that. It's just a different method. And I feel more at home in this one. Um, and something that I do uh, really admire about Zen is that they're looking at it in the sense that of like, we're already doing the whole path all at once. Like, e even if we start on the, on the graduated path uh, and say, like, well, right now I'm going to focus on this thing, by our very um, inherent nature, having Buddha nature, we're already awake. We already have the wisdom. We already have the compassion. We just don't really fully understand it yet. And so there's, like, some obstacles to embodying that completely. So... I kind of want to go over that framework um, to get to where the subject matter is today. Um, and so I doubt that this is complete, um, but it's, it's probably like a good basic overview and thing for everyone to remember. So the, one of the first things we want to do is contemplate the, the four contemplations that turn the mind to Dharma. My favorite, these have a lot of names, but my favorite is the Four Mind Benders. I think that sounds really cool. Um, and you can also say, here are four things to contemplate if you would like to have a meaningful life. And at this point, when we come and we're like saying, well, like, what is Buddhism? What is the spiritual path? We've probably really touched on our suffering and on our confusion. And so having a meaningful life is, is really like something in that moment that we're looking for. Greg, do you mind closing that door? Thank you. Um, so those, those four thoughts uh, are that human life is precious and we've been born in this life. So let's, like, let's do it. You know, it should be pretty motivating when we really think about it. Um, 
The second is the uh, principle of cause and effect. So what we think, what we uh, take in, what we do, all of these things have an effect. There's cause and effect. Um, so we think about that and how those causes and effects uh, us. And once we feel like, yeah, that's true, there is cause and effect operating, right? Then that's kind of a motivation. Well, like, how am I going to behave? How am I going to think? What am I going to take into myself? Um, so that's kind of the, the reasoning behind that one. And then uh, death is eminent. So this is like we're all living, like kind of like we're definitely going to live a long time. We're definitely going to be capable and healthy that whole time. But we don't know. It could come at any moment. Right, and so that's kind of a call of like, don't think you're gonna win the spiritual lottery and all of a sudden it's gonna happen for you. Like, we should probably start now and put in some real effort if we wanna have a meaningful life. And then the last one is that um, some sorrow is suffering. Another way to say that is just like, if, uh, if we're engaged in egotistic pursuits or if we're like really self-concerned, we're always going to find ourselves suffering. And so that should, we should kind of like start to realize that that's the base of our suffering. We think that certain things are going to bring us happiness. Like when I just have more money and my partner treats me with more respect, I, you know, when I have these things, then everything will be better. But um, like if we look through our lives, even when we get what we want, generally we, we end up still suffering. So how do we get out of those? And those are, those pursuits, those worldly pursuits, um, derive internally, and they're called the eight worldly dharmas. So those are seeking gain and avoiding loss, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, seeking praise and avoiding blame, and seeking good reputation and avoiding uh, obscurity or being lonely and unknown. So if we go on that path to start like really contemplating those things and stuff, we'll probably find like, yeah, geez, I'm really caught up in this way of thinking and this way of grasping at a worldly life. And yeah, it's not really bringing me satisfaction. It's not improving my relationships. Things aren't going quite right. So what do I do from there? So the next step would be refuge. And so refuge sets up a, um, I think of it as kind of a dichotomy where now all of a sudden we have things to turn to where before we maybe turn to those worldly pursuits of wealth, food, possessions, relationships, all these things for refuge. And I'm not saying any of those things are like we shouldn't do that. It's really like the intention. If we think that those things are gonna fix us or save us, or make us happy, that's not really the case. There's still, there's reasons to do those things, but they probably aren't the basis for our happiness. So we start looking at, well, with refuge, I can turn to Buddha, my, the innate goodness that we all have, uh, Dharma, the truth and the teachings, and the spiritual community, Sangha. So now, instead of turning to these other things that I thought would make me happy, when I'm in distress, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, when life is hard, I now have these new things that I can practice taking refuge in and seeking some relief from. And with that, we also take some precepts where we say, okay, these five things not only don't bring me happiness, but I find that when I engage in them, there's harm. There's harm to myself and there's harm to others. And those are killing, lying, stealing, sexual misconduct and intoxicants. Right, so that would be like the next step. We're gonna take some vows, we're gonna get serious. We go through a ceremony, we do that, right? And so then we're gonna work for the, with that for a while and also create a relationship with a spiritual friend. Um, so following a spiritual friend, that's a, that's a, uh, what should I say about that? Uh, I think that's like, uh, that's like learning um, how to have a real intimate relationship, like what it means to really be a good friend. Um, and so we can, we can start doing that by um, 
with our teacher, um, learning how to pay attention, listening with the motivation to help others, and we try to retain as much as possible of what we're taught. And so that's kind of the, the beginning of that relationship. Um, once we're now like starting to feel like, okay, I'm doing a lot less harm in my life to the people around me and myself, and I'm having a, a lot less trouble like engaging these activities that are harmful. I, I know how to take care of myself, kind of like, like there might be kind of a feeling of like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Like, wow, like things are actually like okay. You know, maybe not great, but like okay is pretty good. Really, I, I love okay, right? So now I'm kind of okay. Well, what do I, what do I do now that I'm okay? Like, and everything's going like basically okay. Not that like people don't get in car accidents, that like my friends don't die, that like I don't like accidentally find myself in an argument, you know? Not that like life isn't still happening, but like I feel like engaged with my life, like. I want to be a part of this, and um, I understand that these things happen, and I, I, I want to work with it, right? Like, I'm just okay. Okay, well, then I might start thinking, like, well, at least now I'm okay. Maybe, maybe I could help other people. Maybe my friends want to be okay, too. So how does that work? How can I help other people be okay? I've already started these relationships with a teacher and relationships and a spiritual community, so kind of already I have elders like showing me what it's like to be okay and treating me like what it's like to be treated from a place of okay. So I'm getting like some some positive feedback. So then we we look at um, the six paramitas, right? And these are kind of like the the primary activities of a helper. Um, and and. Uh, what I found out I didn't know in um, the six perfections, uh, what they're called is the bodhicitta vows. And bodhicitta is the, the intention to become awakened for the benefit of other people. And so um, these, these activities, which Reb Anderson calls heroic activities, um, are what lead to that um, awakening uh, between people. Uh, also, um, so paramita means uh, literally in Sanskrit par, which is the other shore, and mita, the one who got there. I find this a little bit ironic because so like to get to the other shore is a transcendental action, which means like we're the it's not about an I or the misperceived self yet it's still like the one who got to the other shore. So that's just my kind of sense of humor, the paradox there. Um, and so with that, like when it talks about, well, transcension, the transcending activities, what are we transcending? And we're transcending um, a selfish I, an ego clinging or a misperceived self. Uh, so today talking about the first parameter so there's i should say there's six and they all actually work uh again in order you're kind of all doing them already right but if if we look at them they feed into each other so first is generosity then ethical discipline then patience enthusiastic effort concentration and wisdom and so those all kind of support each other in like an ascending, like say a pyramid or something, right? So uh, Lama was mentioning too, like the type of wisdom here is discriminating wisdom, prajna. Okay, so you'll hear yeshe too, that's primordial wisdom. So that's like complete wisdom. So two different types of wisdom. And in this framework, we're working in a relative sense to build some sort of transcendental wisdom that's discriminating. Uh, uh, and he also, Lama also said that it's important to balance the gradual and sudden paths. So a sudden path would be like, we're awake, right? Like something, a really intense, oh, enlightening experience. 
um, that actually those things should be balanced. So we're going to be working in a gradual way, step by step, and thinking about it like that. And then we're also, that's going to kind of lead to these little awakening experiences that are more like complete. Um, and we can do that by noticing the difference between intentional effort and when something arises spontaneously. Hmm. Yeah, so why bother with generosity? Uh, so in a spiritual past sense, uh, we want to like start being able to support and practice ethical conduct so that less there's less harm in the world. Uh, we harm ourselves less, we harm others less. And if we were to do that without generosity, it becomes tyrannical and fascist, right? We become rule-based, we become hardliners, it's all about discipline. But if first we focus on generosity and the willingness and positive intention to like give away things, then that ethical discipline will just arise somewhat spontaneously and naturally because we'll want to give people safety. We'll want to give people compassion, right? That makes sense. Um, and so then the other reason would be um, like if we're, if we're misers or we cling to things and possess a lot and really think about things in terms of ours, um, it leads to a lot of suffering. And we, don't, we also just don't want to suffer personally, right? Uh, so the Buddha said, when li living beings cling to their ever decaying body and life transient and beyond their control, like dreams and magical illusions, they perform extremely unwholesome acts. Under the influence of confusion, their demonic mount bolts with the unwise into the bad state of the hells. And so I think about that in terms of, um, especially in terms of like my ideas about how things are and the way a situation is or who someone is, once I've got them figured out, like that will always plunge me into discontentedness, some sort of bad emotional state around that thing or person. Um, I think also, right, like I, I remember when I was young and kind of in that survival state with a family and feeling like not making enough money, like then it was like if something got spilled on the couch, it was a big deal. Like I didn't have money for another couch, right? Like this idea of even that material object uh, just became so solidified in my mind, right? Like I couldn't handle like a small thing happening that happens because I was so possessive of what I had, so miserly, because I was so scared that more wouldn't come, right? So in my mind, I had a scarcity mindset or a impoverished mindset. I wasn't even generous internally. Uh, so that, that leads us to, well, what is there to give? And so it's generally classified into three different things. There's obviously material things we can give, um, and then there's, we can give energy. And so that includes like doing things with someone else, listening, talking, doing chores with somebody else, offering protection. And, uh, and something Reb Anderson calls fearlessness, which I'll get to later. Um, so energetically we can offer fearlessness and then there's uh, Dharma which is truth in the teachings. And uh, that's primarily for monks and clergy. You know, like, um, like as students, we practice that a little as lay students, you know, but we should be obviously thinking about like, well, I'm more sharing, right? Like I read these books and now I'm doing kind of a book report kind of thing where like clergy is like gonna do empowerments and like ceremonies and, and things like this, right? Just like, in the material giving world, that's primarily for us lay people. Like monks don't really have any material stuff to give, right? So instead they give their energy and the Dharma and not completely, but you know, in like a kind of general basic way. 
Um, and so uh, Pachal Rinpoche does give a warning that to give Dharma without true understanding and experience or even before our own selfish desires have disappeared in nothing but a sh is nothing but a show. It leads to boasting, increasing the eight worldly dharmas, negative emotional states, and can cause harm to others. Uh, so as lay people, we should always be really concerned with um, uh, our dharma in action, uh, so, like living it. So, yeah, so... Uh, Right, so this speaks to like a readiness to give. So if we're not, if we're, we're giving before we're ready, then it's likely spiritual materialism, right? We're likely trying to give something out of it. We're becoming transactional. Like I'll give my energy, I'll give my time, I'll give the Dharma, and then, right? What, what's coming back my way, right? Um, so the first thing we wanna do is um, practice giving freely and so that's we're going to do a little exercise because one of the things if you don't have anything to give that you can do is you can take a little time and you can give imaginally and so this is very helpful for our internal world to become a giving generous place so what i'd like us all to do is you all got a gift so take your gift in your hand and you're going to hold it. And then we're just going to take a few minutes and meditate on giving into this gift. And so I'll, I'll speak a little bit during that meditation with some ideas of what you can give. But there's no holds barred. Literally in the imaginal world, you can give anything, anything at all. There's nothing to stop you. So please, I'm gonna, I'll ring the bell and begin just giving it all away. So first, maybe just think about what you would like to give. What would make you really happy to give? Like without limitation, you could even give the moon and the stars, castles. Compassion, love, healing, care. I kind of check in like in giving all this stuff. How does how does it make your experience change? Could you give up that experience? Could you give that away? Like what would be difficult to give? What do you have that you don't want to give away? And can you practice that right now?
Could you gently offer someone your anger? Your sadness? Something very precious to you? Okay, now all these gifts are imbued with the universe of your internal being. So then uh, the readings talk a lot about the intention in giving and what that is. And it, you know, we're kind of aiming for this total freedom in giving and just like giving it away without expecting anything in return. Right? But we all know that life does seem, especially in some sorrow, like very transactional, right? So there's things to uh, avoid, uh, like giving with expectation that we think we're going to get something in return, uh, giving out of jealousy. So what that looks like is, um, well, I'm jealous of that person, so I'm going to give stuff to look better than them, right? Or maybe I can give in a way so that I get what they have. Um, uh, we can actually give out of anger. So I'm, I'm going to nice you to death, right? <laughs> like, like, I really don't like you, so I'm going to show you I'm better than you. Yeah. Watch this, right? Um, uh, there can be a sense of greed. Like, right? Like, well, if I give this person this thing, then they have to give me their time. And that's what I want. Or maybe their attention, Right? So I'll do the things or give the things that they want because then I'm going to get what I need and I'm greedy with that, right? Um, and then I think all of us know the, the control one, right? Because if we give, then we're owed in some way. And I think those all kind of relate. Uh, so we want to like be aware of this if we're giving with those things, right? And, you know, I think it's it's different, like, um, in my practice, like I've noticed sometimes like uh, a thought will come up about it. Like I'll know that that exists and I have to check myself. There's a difference between like I'm aware that things happen in a certain way and what my actual intention is. You know, so if I notice a thought like uh, along those lines, like, oh, they'll probably think I'm really nice now. <laughs> right? Like, um, it's okay, like we're supposed to be human, right? So like, can we just become aware of these things operating us and then surrender, right? Surrender to that, let go, and then now we know and we can make decisions around it, right? And we can choose intentions, right? So I think this idea um, of uh, fearlessness that Reb Anderson talks about a lot comes up around that, which is that fearlessness is actually the internal generosity to see what we're doing, to be very honest and vulnerable with ourselves about what and why we're doing things, and to uh, even be generous to that, right? So when I see myself going, wow, I am doing this just to get praise, not looking down on myself for that, but being like, wow, like I'm human, you know, and I'm hurting. I, I need praise. And like, I'm doing these activities for these reasons, you know, so how can I even be generous to that and just start really laying it on like generosity on the generosity internally so that hopefully if I learn how to do that, you know, then I can give it to others that level of openness and generosity. Um, 
and uh, creating uh, spaces where we can look at things together about ourselves that um, maybe uh, we don't like to talk about, but we can be generous, like it's worth talking about and we all understand already that we're human. So we don't have to get super critical about it. We can just look at it, right? Um, that level of fearlessness. Um, so to do that, uh, what the readings recommend for right attitude is something we kind of practice already, this agape attitude, like really try, like full compassion for life. Like I just want to give it all away because this is so good. Um, it's also uh, practicing this generosity should bring an understanding of impermanence, that nothing remains static, everything's moving around. So by giving, we're just taking in part in what is actually already happening. And it gets rid of that possessiveness and starts to break down this like whole I thing, this misperceived self we've got going on, this, this negative ego aspect. Um, but the readings, I thought this was really kind of cute too. All the readings like at some point really assure the reader, like, don't worry. <laughs> the more you give, the more you get. <laughs> like, you're gonna, if you get good at this, supposedly, like you're just going to be trying to give stuff away and like you won't even be able to handle all the stuff coming towards you. It's going to be just crazy. Like, uh, Chogyam Trungpa talks about like, in Asia, the kind of tradition when you go to see a teacher um, and you're going to give them something because you want to give something for the teaching. It's like saying like, um, you're not there. Um, oh, this is another thing to be careful, of, like not to give so that the other person feels beneath you, right? So not like I'm so rich and you're so poor, you poor thing, like let, you need this, let me give this to you, this kind of thing, right? Um, so the reason like students bring things to teacher teachers partially is to say like we're on equal ground like all I have things for you too and they'll give the most precious of their things so uh, he was talking about he would get like women's shoes aprons like all sorts of stuff that like it wasn't even necessarily for him it was that person's most precious thing and they were willing to let it go um, another one with the, um, the being careful about giving is when we give to understand the um, responsibility of what we're giving. So right, like if you give somebody a goat, <laughs> you're giving them a lot of responsibility. Uh, so being kind of cautious around that. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, then like boundaries come up, right? Because if we're like in this like open state of giving, are we going to give it all away and end up destitute? Are we going to be the only ones vulnerable in the room, and then everybody's going to attack us and and really hurt us? Like so, there does have to be boundaries. We do need to learn to say no, and that that's actually also a gift. You know, I'm practicing those no's as a gift. And understanding that that the uh, when we give a no, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be abided by, and we might have to give that gift over and over, and that's both a gift to the other person and to ourselves. Um, so Reb Anderson says that the gift of interpersonal boundaries is a way to love others and ourself. Uh, compassionate no keeps people in a sane world uh, where though we are interdependent, we are not dependent. And so, uh, yeah, hence this also encourages ethics and patience and takes a lot of courage. Um, around boundaries too, Lama always says only give 49%. Right? Like we shouldn't be on a schedule for burnout. We should be giving most of our time, energy, and resources to ourself. Um, yeah, let me see here. I jumped around a little bit. Uh, oh, uh, the readings did warn too that 
like since we're working towards like the no, the boundaries, we are working towards that discriminating wisdom. That's what we're building upon. So that discrimination is important, you know, so that's why we get to say no. And then we also uh, don't have to give if someone is seeking to test us, exploit us, or like I was just talking about, if the person's not um, responsible enough to carry the burden of the gift, or if that responsibility would be too oppressive. And we can give the gift of feedback. That takes a lot of ethics and wisdom. We do that and we can receive the gift of feedback. Uh, that's more of the fearlessness. And opening our hearts, that generosity, that fearlessness opens our heart to receive all of it. And then that uh, kind of closing, uh, this is like, this dichotomy that there's the giver, the gift, and the receiver, right? Those three things have to be there for generosity to occur. Uh, but in actuality, like those things can never exist in a vacuum on their own. Um, so the, there is a non-dual like transcendental activity going on. And actually this activity of exchange is just constantly happening in the universe and so that's like thinking about it in this way should help us kind of get over that really difficult like well i gave you such a nice present <laughs> right so we can uh it shouldn't and I, i'll let trungpa say it better he explains uh, this type of mindset a lot better than i ever could Oh, Lama also said, like, probably the best gift we could ever give away is our head trips. Um, so uh, he says, from there, he was talking about the Theravid, Theravadan style. He says, from there we come to the Mahayana, the great vehicle, which is the open path, the path of the Bodhisattva, the great heroic helper. The narrow path, Theravada, is not merely simple and direct, but also has great character, great dignity. Building on that foundation, we develop compassion. In reality, compassion has nothing particular to do with being compassionate, in the sense of being charitable or kind to one's neighbors or giving regular donations to refugees or paying subscriptions to various charitable organizations, although those things may be included. The charity is fundamental. It amounts to developing warmth within oneself. Out of her simplicity and awareness, the Bodhisattva develops selfless warmth. She does not even think in terms of her own psychological benefit. She doesn't think, I would like to see him not suffering. I does not come into it at all. She speaks and thinks and acts spontaneously, not thinking even in terms of helping or fulfilling any particular purpose. She does not act on religious or charitable grounds at all. She just acts according to the true present moment through which she develops a kind of warmth. And there's a great warmth in this awareness and also great creativity. His actions are not limited by anything, and all sorts of creative impulses just arise in her and are somehow exactly right for that particular moment. Things just happen, and he simply sails through them, so there's a continued tremendous creativity. That is the real act of karuna, a Sanskrit word which means noble heart or compassionate heart. So in this case, compassion does not refer to kindness alone, but to a fundamental compassion, selfless compassion. He is not really aware of himself, so compassion has greater scope to expand and develop because here there is no radiator, but only radiation. And when only this radiation exists without the radiator, it could go on and on and on, and the energy would never be used up. It is always transformed, and as it expands further and further, it changes always into something else, into a new creative activity. So it goes continuously on and on. 
This creative transformation is not merely a theoretical or philosophical concept, but actually takes place in a practical sense, sometimes in a very simple way. We can turn now to generosity, which arises when the bodhisattva is intoxicated by compassion and is no longer aware of himself. His mind is not merely filled with compassion. It becomes compassion. It is compassion. There are six activities associated with this generosity, morality, or discipline, spontaneous discipline, acting according to the true law, patience, energy, and clarity, which is also wisdom or knowing the situation. These are what is known as the paramitas, which, as we said, means transcendent acts. Let me repeat that the bodhisattva is not acting to be virtuous or to overcome sin or evil. His mind is not occupied with being on the side of good or bad. In other words, his activity is limited. It is not, is not limited. It is not bound or conditioned by good and bad. Hence, it is transcendental, something beyond. This may sound a bit abstract, a bit difficult to grasp, and one may ask, how can an act of generosity be transcendental? Isn't this merely a philosophical definition? Well, no, in this case it isn't, because it does not refer only to his action. His mind simply doesn't work like that. When she acts, she is completely spontaneous, free, and being in the present. So she is entirely open, and as far as her mind is concerned, non-active. Activity arises only when the situation presents itself. She may not be continually in a state of selfless awareness, but at least she acts spontaneously. She acts according to the Dharma. And the definition of Dharma in this sense is true law of the universe. Dispassionateness is the Dharma. That is to say that Dharma does not involve any form of desire for achievement. So the act of generosity is performed without reference to any particular reward. Therefore, generosity means not possessing. So the last part of this talk, this practice, is you can take your sacred objects are imbued with all the things and you can put them back in the box when you're ready and see what that is like for you and if that was a mean trick you can keep it <laughs> I don't mind I'm fully ready to give them all away uh, but if you're gonna keep it we should talk about it because most of that <laughs> will be because they're memories so you should know I'd like to share the story with you about them. Is there any questions? You had made a joke earlier in the talk and it went over my head, so I'm just going to take this time to ask for clarification. Okay. It was about um, transcendentalism and the crossing, so I wondered if you could just explain what was funny about it. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah, yeah. So for me, it's um, it's paradoxical because the thing we're transcending is the the personal I. The the ego, the ego self, right? The misperceived I, and then the the root of the word is the one who goes across. Like so, the one would indicate focusing on the personal self. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, both. <laughs> Uh, I just got called out for doing uh, Buddhist dad jokes. <laughs> this is my gift to you. <laughs> Thank you for your talk, Matthew. It was, it was very, very good. Um, I was very surprised when I 
I took the object and, and and you began the thing, and I started thinking about giving away. And I thought, oh, he's going to ask me to give this to somebody. <laughs> 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 and and what I realized, and I hadn't thought about this because I, I don't, I wasn't um, thinking of myself as this type of person, but I realized how attached I can be to material things, and I. You know, and then I started thinking, what, at my house, you know, what I give away? Oh, no, not my artwork, you know. Oh, no, not this. Oh, no, not that. And it was a real eye-opener that I need to be extremely careful of that, uh, that happening to myself. You know, I just, I didn't think about it. Because mm -hmm. I try to share things, and I think of myself as a sharing person. But when you, you know, had me think, okay, I have to give something up. Whoa. <laughs> so thank you for opening another little window in my mind. Definitely. The uh, a couple, I, so you're right. That's totally what I planned on doing initially. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna have us all go to the dojo and then like walk around and um, like feel what it's like to be ready to offer a gift and to receive a gift and, and to exchange uh, with each other. But I thought that would, be a lot of time and I know people have things to do um, so I thought of this uh, but what the readings recommend doing too if uh, if any of you also found it difficult to think about giving it back or giving the object away is to take an object that you find very meaningful or precious to you and then even um, t for yourself practice giving it from one hand to the other So I want to ask you about uh, an experience with giving that makes me not want to give. So and maybe work through that. I don't know. Um, I, I've had the experience where I feel like being generous. Um, so I'm generous. And because we are a transactional society, the expectation is either that they feel like they have to give something back, even though I don't want it. Um, or um, or they feel like I must have an intention, so they start to believe in a story about my intention uh, that isn't necessarily correct. So those things I've seen happen, and they make me uncomfortable with giving. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I have totally noticed these things also, and. Uh, I know you mean like it, that has inhibited me from giving also, you know, so I guess I'm now I'm really curious, like, what if I feel like I give and um, can I do it freely in those situations? And, you know, can I have, I guess, that like generous uh, discipline of mind where um, I don't worry about it? It's hard, yeah. And I, I should bring up, too, because that reminds me of um, something I didn't talk about that's in the readings, which is, um, you know, there are, like, there's formal giving. You know, so there are these forms, like if we go to a birthday party, we take a gift, and, you know, or, you know, so there's, there's ways in which culturally uh, there's a form, um, and, that, and that's somewhat different. We should, like, understand that, that those forms have meaning too, and those are important to act out. I don't know if that helps with what you're thinking about. But. Yeah, I mean, I know here they're really like that transcendental giving. I mean, they're they're like the the bodhisattvas, like just giving it all away. It's it's really impressive. So when I when I think about it about those situations. Um, I can think of one that happened recently. I just had to say, stop thanking me. That bothers me, right? Just take it, right? <laughs> um, in, in another case, I realized that I recognize in retrospect, I think what I would do differently is just to, just to state my intention, that this is, what, this is why I'm doing this and no other reason. Mm -hmm. And all of those seem like, sound like gifts to me both the, the gift of that boundary when it was bothering you and being able to give the gift of who you are and explaining that, and then also the thinking about, well, in the future, I could give the gift of my intention mm -hmm. along with it. Oh, sorry, I don't know which way to go. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, so I'm I'm gonna give a gift right now, and it's a confession. <laughs> so um, I also thought, oh, he's gonna ask us now to give this to somebody else. So guess where my mind went? I'm looking around. <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, I sure do like that amethyst that um, Autumn has. <laughs> and I thought, well, I was looking in that box, and I thought, oh, this looks like petrified wood, and that is so cool. And I saw something else that I didn't pick up, and I thought, well, gosh, I wonder what that was. And I see that Alex has it, and I thought, oh, I could, I could share. I could give mine to Alex, and maybe I could get that thing. So that's my gift, my confession, and some people laughed, so... So yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the laughter and a good explanation of how the eight worldly dharmas work. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share something that Lama had taught me. Um, in, in 2018, we lost um, our house in the campfire and we moved here, and a lot of people just wanted to give us things because we had lost everything and it was a big deal. And at first, I was I was having a hard time just taking it because you know I'm like oh no no I feel bad about people just giving us stuff for free, um, but Lama had said that accepting it was helping the person giving it experience mm -hmm. gratitude or I mean generosity. So. Yeah, enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like a gift from me to give to them. To receive, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Heather, for that. Because one of the things that I find is most difficult is how do you prevent others from feeling uncomfortable um, or feeling that you've given them something and they don't have anything to give back or they need to give back? I mean, how do we word that so they understand it's... It's just like you said, giving and that they should accept it and not feel that they're beneath you or they don't have as much or, you know, it's, I find that really hard sometimes. To, I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable by something I'm giving, but I don't really know how to say something without making them feel worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the readings talk a lot about that in terms of what what our intention is, and that's that's the the part where we have empowerment, right? Like we, we can't really be empowered to um, be inside someone else and be their feelings for them or be their reaction. So if we empower ourselves by giving with the right intention and hopefully holding that intention, if they did have some sort of bad feeling and hopefully we're in a space where they felt generous sharing that with us, and you know, now we're having another gift, which is this like open, vulnerable, real conversation around that. So we could learn together. It is hard. I have a small response actually, Sue. In my professional work, we'll call me a social worker, if you will. So oftentimes my clients come to me asking for help or resources or time ultimately just to sit and chat about whatever's going on and sometimes they come back but like because i have those abundances to offer there are oftentimes people come back and say how could i ever repay you or or can i do this thing for you that can help you know make me feel better and the way i've been able to word it back for those people because i don't want to receive something back is please put that energy and intention into being kind to someone else or to yourself because a lot of times the people that I work with are not being kind to themselves like I know I can be. Mm -hmm. And so my abundance comes from my internal kindness. And so if I can like, you know, thank you, great, yes, and, and thank you for thanking me, but I don't need anything other than you putting intention into being kind for yourself or others. So that's my, yeah, to like, you know, don't put that intention back to me, please share it with others if you feel it so strongly. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, and I 
can't remember if you touched on this or not, um, but it has to do with giving because it makes me feel good to give. Is that in a way a bad thing because it's helping me? Sometimes I joke with people that don't want a gift or, well, that don't want to acknowledge their birthdays. Like I had a friend who had a birthday and it came up somewhere that it was her birthday and she was like, I'm not doing it. And I said, honey, it's not about you. It's about me. I want to give you something, you know, <laughs> or I want to wish you a happy birthday. So, so yeah, that it makes me feel good to give because it really does. But is, I mean, is there something wrong about that giving because it makes me feel good because I enjoy it so much? Yeah, it reminds me of the the thing, right, with the in, intention to be enlightened for the benefits of the other. It's like, well, it's still I who want to be enlightened. So if I have that wish, that's that's actually a sticky spot in the in the transcendental sense. You know, I've heard Lama say a lot too, like. Um, we should really try to focus that intention on doing it for others, but then we're very free and open to receive the fruits of the practice. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so, like, I another birthday thing. Like, my I have kids, and so they go to birthday parties, and I have always really liked to give presents, and I'll spend like fifty dollars for whatever kid birthday we have just because I like giving like picking out things that I thought think the kid might like and stuff because I just like to do it and I don't really care about getting credit for it in any way but it's something I like to do and so that they're expecting a gift you know and I, I could keep the name off I don't care about that but I still enjoy doing it so do you think that's still a sticky spot mm -hmm. uh, I think the sticky spot is when um, we're looking at a return you know, I think that that open, like, I'm so filled with compassion that I want to give, and this feels great being compassionate. I, uh, I, I think I think there's a differentiation there. I'm still processing the things that get in my way of giving, and I, and you mentioned it actually uh, when when you feel like it, it's abusive, right? When if you're if you become a giver, there's plenty of takers out there, and they're looking for you. Mm. So, um, any advice on how to approach the people who become? You know, I I say that, and I, and I, it's really sad. But I'm thinking about my daughter. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, that definitely makes us think about our daughters. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so it, it is it is leading towards wisdom, you know, and that that wisdom isn't um, giving for others to exploit us. Mm -hmm. You know, I would I would love like to say in in some way that there's a rule book that like okay now I have the rule book and I can just go through and like I'll know, but it's not the way uh, practice works. You know, it's very, it's very gray, and it's, we've got to be engaged. Yeah. I think I really needed today's talk. It was amazing. Thanks. I really, like, had so many levels. Thank you so much. It's really deep, deep. Uh, one of the things I was thinking of is if you've ever given a gift to somebody, and they rejected it. And then I think maybe in the reaction to the rejection, you kind of can see your own motivation. I've had that experience mm -hmm. where it bounced back and then I was pissed off. <laughs> because I'm enlightened, yeah. <laughs> well, there's definitely awareness there. That's great. Is it working now? Okay, good. So the 
the item that I grabbed is this uh, lion pendant, and it made me think of my dad. Um, he's always liked lions, and so I was just curious if I could know the story behind that. Uh, so that I got that in Mexico this last spring, and uh, I was drawn to it because there's this uh, there's a story in our lineage that um, uh, about uh, concentration and like knowing what's meaningful in our heart at all times. And it's like, uh, if, if a dog is coming at you and you throw a bone, the dog will chase the bone, but a lion goes for the person. <laughs> so um I, I, I would say it's is a, it's supposed to be about like staying staying in touch with what's most meaningful in our heart Got so it. yeah it's a it's a pretty dramatic representation of that i guess <laughs> I want to talk to Patty. <laughs> well, um, well, it's uh, two things. Um, just it's like because I'm a mom of four. I think sometimes it's not generous, really, to give our kids what they want. It's not because if we give them what they want, it's not really necessarily good for them. So I just that came to my mind. Not, and so I'm pretty weak, so I don't want to act like I got that figured out. But um, <laughs> you, it's not, you, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing, it's just off topic, but um, you know, uh, when you tell a joke and, and then the explanation that made us laugh, right? And it reminded me one time a few years ago, I was watching some little talk show and the host, uh, the Dalai Lama was the guest, and the host told a joke to the Dalai Lama. And the joke was real simple. Uh, I'd like to order a pizza. Uh, I'd like one with everything. And uh, so, you know, one with everything. He, he And the Dalai Lama is just a translator, you know, like trying to figure it out. <laughs> just, it really fell flat. <laughs> that's funny. But that just made me laugh. Sometimes, you know, it's like that. You know, it's we like laugh at the, at the not work. <laughs> it's true. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, children are a uh, real a real benefit in the gift of interpersonal boundaries and, and intention, right? Because I know as a dad, sometimes I'm like, no. And the no is really just coming from a place of like, I don't have capacity right now to think about this, you know, or, or to allow generosity into my life, you know, and like balancing those two things. It's, it's a continual effort with young people who are completely okay with testing us. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. So, um, you know, thanks for your talk, Matthew. It definitely made me think kind of in this kind of expansive way. And I was thinking about how we talk a lot about the perfection of wisdom. I mean, we spend all this time analyzing the perfection of wisdom. And I was thinking about the perfection of giving it must be this really amazing thing, you know, and Trungpa was kind of pointing to that a little bit. And I was thinking how it must be so spontaneous that you don't even really feel like you're giving. It's almost like you're in a place to where you're just open and giving and just completely in it, you know? And it's like with like an ordinary mind like mine, it's like I have to work myself up to giving, you know? And, it's, and it was kind of cool because it's like, this is where we're going. This is kind of the, the place that we want to be, you, we want to go towards, you know? And I was, anyway, it's just, it's, it's neat to see like the, you know, pointing towards the place, you know, and I felt like that with your talk and with this, with the reading too, so thanks. So. Jack has a question. On the oh, hi, Jack. Oh, um, Jack right? Hi, Matthew, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, something I struggle with a lot, and I was thinking about how Oftentimes, I will give with the mindset of, I don't actually want to be giving this right now, but I know it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and so 
there's kind of like both a reluctance um, and maybe a little bit of like wanting to be bodhicitta. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering if we're in that state of mind, like, what do you think of that? Like, should we wait until we're actually like wanting to give or is it okay to be kind of like reluctant knowing that it's a good thing to do? Uh, what Reb Anderson talks about is in that moment, when you notice it, then being generous to the fact that you're feeling that way. And I trust that you'll make the right decision. Thank you, friend. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. <laughs> So uh, I I don't know if you have an answer for this because I certainly don't, which is why I'm asking. But we're also interconnected, and especially you know I have a family, I have a husband, I've got kids. So like I don't feel like anything is really mine to give because whether it's my time or my money, it's shared with the entire family. So like like it's almost like I need consent to give anything. Does that make sense? Like if it's, it's like, I can't just be like, oh, here's a bunch of money because then it affects like three other people. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, that it, there, it sounds like there's, there's gonna be a lot of generous conversations <laughs> about that and, and probably that you uh, need to be generous with yourself give yourself like I give you consent to give to you wait say that again give consent to what to give to yourself <laughs> like if i could <laughs> i would i would give you consent to give to yourself oh okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right thank you mm -hmm. I'm not the teacher in this situation, but it always makes me think when I think of mothers and fathers that uh, you know the airlines have taught us a lot of things over the years and we negate to listen to them. And this is one thing we should listen to and that is, yep, when the plane starts losing altitude and the masks come down, what's the first thing they tell you? You put it on yourself so that you can help others. Mm -hmm. And as parents, I'm not a parent, but I was raised by two and the last of six kids. And I can tell you that they would have been a lot less successful at raising us if they didn't give to themselves first to make sure that they were there for us. So in those moments, I think what Matthew's saying is he's giving you consent to put the mask on first and then look around, but always put the mask on first. And it does get complicated like that, you know, with spouses, like if, you know, you're having shared resources and stuff, there, I mean, there does have, have to be conversations, I imagine. I'm, I'm guessing any like long-term successfully married people can give us a hint on how that works. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> That's a real wisdom required. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I started taking these like little mini vacations for myself a couple of years ago. And um, what I found was strange is like, I'd decide to go do something and I'd do it. And then afterwards I'd feel like totally lost for a few minutes. Like I'm so used to just doing what, because usually there's somebody else there saying, I want to do this now. Well, let's go do this. Right. And so I was like, wow, I'm making every decision for myself. <laughs> this is very free. <laughs> yeah. I got used to it really quick. <laughs> Should we do prayers? All right, dedication prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. 
May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Chenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholder of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avogatishvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire hosts of Maras. Sankopa, crown jewel, snowy land sages. Losangdrapa, at your Lord's feet. Are there any uh, announcements at all? Hi. Um, next weekend is a very big weekend. Um, on Sunday is um, a refuge ceremony and an entering the path ceremony. So if you're at all interested in seeing what that's like and hearing a really good talk, there's always a really good talk on, on those Sundays. Um, please come. And there's also usually a really good potluck, too, just by the way. Um, after the Sunday service, um, I'm not sure, is he going to do, oh, he is going to do, okay, he'll do, okay, so then, then there's a call of chakra, but at 2.30, so if you want to leave and come back or stick around for call of chakra, um, but at 2.30, we're having a meeting of sorts. It's more like a formation um, of people getting together to talk about, and this is a very giving, actually. Um, so we're trying to form a a group of, or a group think, a, some sort of an atmosphere of giving um, at the temple. Not that we don't have it, but we're kind of trying to sort of formalize it. And so we have had one meeting, and we're going to have another one next Sunday at 2.30, of people who are interested in doing um, caring, and caring for others. Um, whether it's doing volunteer work in the community, whether it's helping people within our very little community here, which is actually quite a large community. Um, maybe it's just within your family. Maybe you're a caretaker of your mom or you got kids, right? So you're a caretaker there. Um, how do we give? How do we care? Um, and how do we support each other doing that? Um, so that's, you know, it, it sounds kind of a um, uh, not very well thought through and not very well formed. And that's because we're kind of just starting. But we want to create an atmosphere, a community of giving and caring. And that's what this meeting is about at 2.30 next Sunday. Um, there'll be Lama there and anybody and everybody who wishes to attend. Um, there's no, you don't have to be a refuge student, you don't have to be a long time student, you can be brand new and just still come just to kind of hear what he has to say and so that we can all hear what we each have to say about what it's like to care and what it's like to give and what it's like to be part of a a caring and giving and helpful community. So that's my spiel for next Sunday. Thanks. Anything else? Ready? All right. We also have a donation box at the back, so that's the final thing. <laughs>
Portrait, yeah. <laughs>